welcome to Information Please, your Peoria Public Library on the air, bringing you information about your library and your community. This evening my guest is Terry Miller from Peoria Public Library's Outreach Services, but she also serves on one of the Mayor's Advisory Committees and has some important information for everybody, I think. Hi Terry. Hi. <laughs> How are you, Tricia? I'm good. Well, one of the things you do is you serve on this, uh, what's the t official title? of The, the advisory? Mayor's Advisory Committee on the Disabled. Okay. And you do that because of your work with the Outreach Department. You know a great deal about not only the challenges people face, but what services are available to help them. Yes. And so one of the big things that's happened is they're changing all of the parking programs. Uh, it's a big change. It's a we're huge change. Effective January 1st, 2014, and we're trying to get the word out to everyone who has a disability placard or yeah. license plate. Yeah, and it's not only that, but it's everybody else around them that's using those facilities and people who run buildings, and there's there's a lot and involved the, with the change. And the police big. department and mm -hmm. the parking enforcement, and because a lot of it stems to that before um, anyone who had a disability placard or license plate got mm -hmm. free parking and meters on the street. Uh -huh. Well, that all goes away January 1, and they've created a new four-tier system okay and there yes there's still going to be disability plates and placards but if you have a plate you also now must have a placard to hang in your windshield and there's okay. four different ones of those um, there's a gray and yellow striped if you have that placard then you get free parking okay in, in are the they meters. doing like income checking or what to make it's, it that way the General Assembly did this mm -hmm. law, and now the Secretary of State has to recertify everyone. And what it is is that when they recertify, there is also a new form. And one side is for the regular disability, and the other is for, say, somebody who's in a wheelchair or um, power scooter or something, and they can't get to the meter. Ah. Then that's how they're deciding on okay. who so gets, it's, it's not income based, it's rather than disability based. I see, I see. So if but they're you, figuring that other people, if you can make it to the meter, you should be, be paying. paying. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some new law enforcement guidelines and parking enforcement, mm -hmm. um, getting used to what the placards are. Like I said, uh, earlier that there's a gray and yellow okay. which entitles the person to park in the meters free. Okay. There's the regular blue which is a permanent disability. Mm -hmm. There's a red that's a temporary and then there's a green for organizations. Oh, okay. Um, I did not know about the green one until I received information. So is that like a senior center? Senior van? center, um, the like the Peoria Blind Center may qualify for one park, or okay. used to be, which is now Ep Epic. Um, organizations like that that transport yeah folks um, with disabilities. individuals with disabilities, so they can they can actually park right at a disabled, but they have to pay. <laughs> yes, they do have to pay. Um, people are so used to having just disability license plates, mm -hmm. you know, with the wheelchair on them. Now you're not. You only have to have, if you have a disability plate, you still have to have the placard. Before, if you had a plate, you didn't need a placard. So, is there, do you know a reasoning behind that? or um, It's to be able to identify the free parking. I see. And the General Assembly did this, which then the Secretary of State had to do everything. Mm -hmm. Letters started going out in April. Okay. Um, to recertify, and you had to have your doctor or mm -hmm. your professional that you see mm -hmm. sign off on it and basically they're the ones that decide if you have which side of the form they sign. I see. One sign is yes they can't walk long distances, um, they need closer parking. But they could get to the meter. They could get to the meter. The other one is is you know they're in a hover round chair and they can't get up over the ramp to get to the meter. Mm -hmm. So it depends which form your doctor or professional signs. I see. 
And then, of course, something like breaking your leg. Right. You'd get the, the temporary one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Or a, sur a surgery. Surgery, or something. foot in a cast, you know, in a wheelchair for a short time. Mm -hmm. But now, if you have the, the license plates, you also have to have a placard. And that's probably the biggest change. Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the things we're trying to get out to the community through the mayor's advisory committee is to make sure everybody is complying. Um, if they haven't changed their address and they've moved, they probably didn't get this letter. So they need to contact the Secretary of State's office as soon as possible. Real, real quick. Because it's supposed to all be done by January 1, but we all know that doesn't happen. Right. So right. everyone has, no matter if your placard says it doesn't expire until July of 2014, everybody had to reapply, which now they're good, then we'll be good to until 2018. Oh, well, that's, that's something. So it'll be good for four years. Okay. And I, and I think this is a good time to remind people, too, that um, I know there's, people will get angry about the silliest things, but I know people will see someone who appears to be perfectly healthy and well and has a placard and parks in the, you know, disabled spot and walks into a building and they'll just be ballistic over, you know, this person shouldn't be parking there. And they often don't realize that many disabilities are invisible. Correct. There's heart problems. Mm -hmm. There is people who have eyesight and problems. I have that in my family. Yeah. Um, my husband's legally blind. We have a handicap card for him. No, he doesn't drive. I drive him, but he still can't see to walk long distances from the mall or from Walmart or something like that. So yeah. it's not it's not always visible mm -hmm. to the eye. Mm -hmm. It could be they may have cancer. Yeah. Or emphysema or some other yeah, illness. something that isn't showing and you right. may be seeing them on a on a day when they feel well enough to go out so right. they look fine. COPD. But, yeah. That's a big common problem with a lot of middle-aged to elderly mm -hmm. that can still drive, but they have to do things in short spans. Right, because they can't, they absolutely cannot breathe. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of different illnesses and disabilities out there that aren't known to everyone. Yeah, yeah. And so think twice before you assume somebody's Right, cheating. right. But make sure you have that placard if you do have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And make sure that you put money in the meter right. or you're going to get a ticket right. for not paying for the meter. Right. And, it, and so this is another question that's just occurred to me, but if someone has the placard but didn't put the money in the meter, is that a different ticket than if you don't have a placard? You know, you're not you're not disabled. You park in the disabled spot, and you just because, and you can get a ticket for that too. But are there tiers of tickets like disabled but didn't pay, as opposed to not disabled and if didn't it's, pay either? <laughs> if it's a regular parking meter, mm -hmm. not a handicapped, mm -hmm. um, I I don't know positive. I would think it'd be just a parking ticket, but I, you know, don't hold that to me because I'm not, yeah. I'm not positive on that. Yeah, but the best solution is just to get if in the doubt, pay the straight. meter. <laughs> yeah, pay the meter. Pay, pay the, the meter. meter. Yeah. Um, but there's there are publications too. Yes. There's there's the law enforcement guide, mm -hmm. and there's persons with disability brochure, and there's a guide for medical professionals. So all of those are available, and. and at the Secretary of State's mm -hmm. office. Right, so. right. You can get those. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if we don't have some of those available at the at the library, particularly the persons with disability right. brochure. Yeah. And so, and over the past year, of course, you know, there's been informational meetings and things like that, but it's still hard to get the word out, especially with everything else that's going on, changes with, with uh, the... Affordable Health Care Act, right. and this kind just of get lost, in right? And that's all the just kind of taken a back seat to some of the bigger things. Mm -hmm. um, 
but one of the things the committee wanted to do is to get this out to the public because right. we'll, um, the committee is there to represent the concerns of the disabled community in the Peoria area. Right. Um, and so has Peoria law enforcement all been advised of all this? Do you know? As, yes, and they, um, they have some questions just like the rest of us have. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they got the same information sent out and they got sent the information that we received as well. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Well, it all sounds good and like it's out there, but you might have to go look for it. If you're not clear on what you need to do, you might have to go look. And of course, a librarian can help you on the computer yes. get to the Secretary of State site mm -hmm. right. to and get some clarification. That's what so. I was just going to say. If you have questions, we can always help you look it up on the Secretary of State's the website, like you said. Mm -hmm. and. Um, if need be, make out some printouts or email it to you or whatever whatever mm -hmm. we need to do. Yeah, so. And that can be done at any of our facilities. Right, right, anywhere can help you. So let's talk a little bit about outreach again. It's, it's always hard for me to get you to come <laughs> because you're too busy. <laughs> but outreach services does an awful lot of different services and just naming those could take up the rest of the hour. But why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the things you do and how you find the people to help? Well, one of our big programs is the homebound service that we provide where we pick out the books specifically for you. We deliver them on the first Thursday of the month. We come back the next first Thursday of the month, pick them up, exchange them. We do not only books, but we do DVDs. We do books on CD. Um, we have brochures that we can mm -hmm. send out. We've placed ads in um, like church bulletins and doctor's right. offices and different locations, word of mouth, um, Meals on Wheels. Um, last year we started advertising on Meals on Wheels. We sent um, our pamphlet to them specifically uh -huh. on talking books for people who were getting those meals and we got really, for our first try, we've got like 10 responses. They're always a little leery. They're like, we don't want someone to come into our home. Yeah. But we never send anybody alone. We do the buddy system. Yeah. Um, so uh, to make them feel comfortable, we do a whole reference interview. What do you like to read? How much do you read in a month? Um, we have all, we have Westerns and mysteries and romances and and the Harley Quinn romances and nonfiction and um, biographies and bestsellers. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole collection that's dedicated to serving the outreach department being the homebounds. We, another program we offer is that we have deposit sites at several nursing homes and senior facilities mm -hmm. throughout Peoria. Um, I believe we're at 14 that we and that take. And that sounds funny if people aren't familiar with library lingo, a deposit site, but it's a kind of a mini library, It is. Isn't it? We take 40 books a month. We may leave them for 30 days to 90 days, and mm -hmm. then we rotate them out every 30 days, every four weeks. We rotate them out, so there's always a rotation of books going in and out. Um, some of the facilities include Independence Village, um, Bickford House, Proctor, Bueller, um, Sharon Elm, Sharon Pines, Manor Care, St. Augustine's. I mean, we have a whole lot of them. Um, Hawthorne out at Liberty Village that we rotate and we work with the activity directors. So if anyone's interested in starting a new deposit collection, on-site mini library, they can give us a call at 497-2068 and we'll get them set up and put them on a delivery rotation. And Yeah, and I think, I think our outreach services go way, way back to the days when you think about 
you know, having the cart of books and walking through the hospital. Yes. And we still have one of those we, old we carts. Do. We, we do. <laughs> it's on display in the Friends bookstore. But That cart sat in the outreach office for a long time, and yeah. I was really sad I had to give it up and leave <laughs> it downtown when we moved to the North Branch. Well, it used to be a display for your office, right. but it's still on display. It is still on display. And, uh, yeah, and so that's that's a long, long time service. It's just it's changed and evolved. It, as yes life has we didn't actually didn't used to have senior living and assisted living right. and that kind of thing how do we keep track of the books that go to those little mini libraries all over the city they're checked out till we have a library card for that facility mm -hmm. that is used just by us so nobody can charge anything to it um, come in and say I live at Bueller home and I want to use the yeah the they card. have their own they have to have their individual card for that but mm -hmm. we check them out for 90 days on their individual card. Mm -hmm. The same with the homebound person that we deliver to. We make up cards for them and keep them in the outreach office that are good only for our use. If they, um, we do have one patron who has their own card because they wanted to access our databases. I see. So, and we got them their own card instead of using the outreach card to do that. And if they wanted to check anything else out, they could do with that. Yeah, and that does add another dimension with the eBooks. If you have someone who wants to download to a computer, a tablet, um, an e-reader, and you can get them set up with a card and a PIN number and show mm -hmm. them how to do that. Mm -hmm. And there's still people very active. They may be homebound, but their minds are very active and they enjoy everything you can read, all the newspapers, all the hot topics, all the things that are in our databases is just, you know, the whole world is right there. Um, of course, you can't use Ancestry.com from home, but we have Heritage Quest if right. you have people working on genealogy. So for the homebound, that's another aspect of the library that, that they can take advantage of if they want to. Yeah. And then in addition to your homebound service and our deposit collections, or our mini libraries as I was calling them, we have our fabulous bookmobile. We do have the bookmobile um, that is on a two-week rotation. We visit some senior facility, apartment places, mm -hmm. a lot of daycares, neighborhoods, and schools. We have District 150 schools and we have private schools as well. That's great. And what's the point of taking it there? To the schools or just yeah, anywhere? Anywhere. Why, why, why do we need to do that? Why do we need to load a bus up with books and take it out? So we do that in order to get the materials into the hands who, of patrons who don't always find it easy to get to one of our buildings. Right. Um, I've had many daycare teachers tell me that it's the experience that children get with, that are in the daycares that have working mom and dads mm -hmm. who may not get to the library. They have their own library card. They get to come in, they get to check out their books and the smiles it brings to those kids' faces. And then they grow up to be lifelong readers. Yes. And they grow up to be our tax supporting system. Mm -hmm. And you get them at an early age. Yeah. Just, That's so important for them for school and everything right. else. And, Kids who are in daycare, often their parents are just exhausted by the time they get home from work and deal with small children. And it's, you know, they're to bed early. They're, they're right. tired because they've been playing and learning all day. And it's, it's not like the 1950s when mom was home and you got done with school at three and then, you know, you got to play outside and then have dinner and then have a nice long evening ahead of you. That's not what happens these days. And so this way they're, these kids do actually get to read something. Right. And they read the teachers, check out books and read to them. And so that means the teachers have fresh books mm -hmm. instead of reading the same books over and over. And when we go to the schools, um, a lot of the schools, the kids aren't from that neighborhood. Right. And there may not be a library close to them by the time they get home from school. And school there. libraries are not what they used to no. be. School school libraries were never that. I mean, my school library, even you know, as a child, couldn't keep up with my reading. 
but now school libraries are pretty thin pickings yeah. most of the time yeah. and they're serving an enormous number of children with a very small collection. And so the bookmobile does give them the opportunity to get what they need. And people can request things to be brought in the bookmobile. They can, just like placing a hold on a book to be picked up at North or Maine or Lincoln. They can do the same and have it picked up on the bookmobile at your weekly location. Right. We've had people who found out the book is on the library are on the bookmobile. They've called. We've tracked the bookmobile down, and they've tracked the bookmobile down and said, "Do you still have this book?" And um, <laughs> there was a, a time that we were getting ready to pull away from somebody, one corner stop, and this lady came running up, and so we stopped and wanted to know what the problem was. We thought there might have been an emergency or something, yeah. and she needed a cell phone or something. And she's like, "I understand you have this book, and I want this book before you leave." <laughs> And so, I mean, we have stories like that that happen all the time, so. Yeah. Well, and sometimes um, you do story times places too, don't at, you? At some of the daycares, we do do story times. Um, and those usually have to be scheduled in advance. Right. That's something they, a special thing they call and, and ask about. Because we would need to be able to send a second person mm -hmm. on the bookmobile to keep the bookmobile open while... We did story times in the building. Right. And of course, all of our locations will do that for schools or daycares right. they can call. And our librarians will go out and do a story time for a group, which is a, a great thing. It is. Yeah. We have another program that outreach oversees, and that's the Talking Books for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, Okay. which is um, a free federally funded program from the Library of Congress. Okay, and so you're the local access. So to we're the, the local access to that, and everything's digital now. Ah. Um, next time I come, I'll have to bring the new machine, and um, it's like a flash drive. Wow. Um, when I first started working in outreach, or before while I was still in college, they had the big old floppy plastic records. Yeah. In the big cases and this big record player mm -hmm. and then they kind of moved away from that and went to four-sided cassettes that we all used to have in our cars and now they've transitioned from that to a flash drive Wonderful. the whole book is on one flash drive and what what do they play that on it's on a special player it's no bigger it's about the size of this half sheet of paper real lightweight rechargeable um, Prior to them going to this new machine, you might have 10 tapes that you had to keep flipping over. Now with this little, the little cassette is no bigger than a pack of playing cards. Wow. That just gets plugged into the end. And well, I'd imagine people who had an issue with sight might have had problems with keeping those tapes straight. Right, because you had to flip over a tape and push a button and mm -hmm. side one became three and two became four. and. Um, even a sighted person, I had trouble at times <laughs> going, where am I? Yeah. Um, when I was trying to explain that. So yeah. that's evolved over the, over the years. And so we see that as well and oversee that program with um, also as part of the, the state program and the federal program. And what does someone have to do to qualify for that? There is a special application mm -hmm. that um, they need to one of the things is, is first of all, you, know, you may be legally blind mm -hmm. or really poor vision or can't stand to hold a book, regular print, for 15 minutes. Students with a learning disability like dyslexia mm -hmm. also would qualify because they also do student textbooks at times. Ah, okay. Um, and these are all forms that, that if you have the reading disability in a student, you need to have that um, form signed by a doctor. Okay. Um, we can mail the form out. If you come in to see us and pretty much, we know if you're coming in with a white cane, you need, you need <laughs> the information. We as librarians can sign the form. We just can't sign anybody that's a family member. I see. 
So, so you have to see the actual person. Right. And you actually have a, n a nice little room where you can meet with people. Yes, we do. And, uh, and talk things over privately. Right. By the outreach department. And we have, the, we have individuals that can have their own player. There's also institutional application that a facility can have players to use in their activities for, for reading books to like maybe a group. Okay. Um, but yeah, we have, um, you have quite a few nursing homes and that kind of thing that could probably take advantage yes. of that. Yes. Yeah. And of course the library also has, um, things like tumble books and our eBooks and mm -hmm. our audio books right. that if they have a library card and a pin number, your computer can do that for you. And of course you have to be adept at, you know, working the computer for those who have impaired vision with being able to, you know, click on the right things and all that, either a family member or doing it for yourself. But it's, it, once you learn how, it's very easy to do. And also along with the talking books, there is a program called BARD. And I, right now I forget what the acronym what for BARD, Bard stands, stands for. for. But they can download from the Library of Congress site oh, okay. onto a flash drive and listen to that book as well. Okay, so they um, have more access more and more access. choices doing yes. that. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, Terry, thank you for joining me today. And we're going to make sure we get more of this information out and in the newsletter and make sure people know it's out there. Thank you, Tricia. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wanting to remind you that your Peoria Public Library offers services for everybody not just those who can come into the library and check out a book and paper book and read it. Um, so if you are interested in any of those services, you can call our outreach department, you can email them, or you can stop in at any branch and ask for help how to contact them. Whether you have um, challenges with your vision or mobility, whatever it is, just um, you need, need to talk to someone about, hey, how do I get the bookmobile to come to my location? Any of those things, Outreach would be more than happy to help you. There's plenty more information about all of our activities at www.peoriapubliclibrary.org, and we'll see you next week on Information, Please. <music>